ideas and you know I said you know but I'm really someone who when I talk about something like I usually make it happen and she said yeah you know me too I said okay all right cool so maybe we can do something and this the year before I started I found a Cuban salsa festival in Barcelona I love to dance Cuban salsa or timba and I decided well why don't I go someplace else to dance I've been dancing enough in the Bay Area and I found this festival in Barcelona um, and it just didn't work with my schedule to be able to go I stayed on top of of their social media account and I found out that they were going to Greece the following year and I mentioned it to Diane and Diane said yeah, Greece. I really want to go to Greece. Let's do it. So she had danced salsa in college and stuff. And so we both started dancing together. And then that was sort of how this trip that we'll tell you about um, our, our main sort of theme got started. It started with our love for dance and it took us to another country. So I'll let Diane introduce herself and then we'll get started. Hi, I'm Diane Marte. I'm the uh, department chair of fashion. Um, yeah, this is my third year. Uh, this is the end of my third year here. And I, I love a lot of things. Like, basically, this presentation, we're going to discuss how it pretty much influences my life, my creative process. Um, I'm still creative, even though I'm teaching. And, um, and just how, overall, it makes a really great impact on your life and how it can change your life as well. All right, so our first topic is patience in perspective. So how many of you guys have traveled outside the country yet? Good, that's awesome. So I'm talking to people who already know what it's like, right? Um, I always tell people that you just have to travel. Uh, and, and there are a number of people in our community that haven't left the city of Sacramento, haven't left the county of Sacramento, right? Even um, my mom, who is super well-read, and she's traveled across the U.S., when I tell her about things in other countries, they just come to life in a way that you can't even imagine when you read in a book, even if it's a novel, right? So one of the things you learn in travel is you have to have patience, right? Because nothing ever goes as planned all the time when you travel. And it gives you perspective. One of the best things that I've learned is that there's more than one way to do something in this world, right? You see the media and you see just kind of all of our images and we're told that there's one kind of cookie cutter way to get things done. One way to go to school. One way to become the CEO. One way to have a family. One way to do this or that. But when you travel you get to see that people all over the world are living in different ways and they're surviving and enjoying themselves and then it allows you to take a look at what you're doing in your own life to see do you want to keep going you know do you not would you want to pivot somewhere do you want to implement something else so I just have a few pictures this is um, this looks probably way cooler than it is um, this is one of those slack lines have you guys ever seen a slack line yeah um, they, I live in Oakland and they have them at Lake Merritt all the time this summer and they're like, you know, five feet off the ground. These people are doing almost flips on them. I look like I'm off the ground and I'm like two inches off the ground. But <laughs> before I got up there, I was like, you know, there's no way I could do this. First, at first it looks really easy and then you try and get on there and then you realize it's probably one of the hardest balance things that you could possibly do. And then once you get it for even like five seconds, you feel really, really cool. This was at the Salsa Festival um, in Greece, and someone had just packed it with him in his suitcase. And I never, like, I never would have tried it, you know. I just look at the people in Oakland and do and go, uh-huh, okay. But, <laughs> but somehow it took me having to be in another um, country to be able to do it. These are plane tickets from a flight in Cuba, actually. And, you know, nowadays, how many of you guys check in for your flights on your phone, right? Yeah, I do too. I just did it for my flight tomorrow. Um, we had to go to the counter to tell them our names, and then they had to handwrite our tickets. And, you know, we already have very little patience when we travel anyway, but then doing that in another country and looking at this, you know, by our standards, this antiquated system, forces you to have a little bit of patience. And then the last little story I'll tell about is uh, in the trip to Brazil. I went um, for the World Cup four years ago, more than four. Not this past one, but the one before that was in Brazil, right? One of my best friends is Brazilian. Her mom has a house in one of the well, a small coastal town. And her mom was telling us like, yeah, I've got this buggy. Now we think her mom is telling us like a slug bug, right? But what she really means is like a sand buggy that you ride 
on the beach in. But this is her car, her mode of transportation. We get there, my friend can't drive a stick. I'm the only one who can do it. Um, but my friend speaks Portuguese, and so she's like, you go down here, you drive through here. So this car is already a struggle to drive, right? Then she's like, oh, there's the bridge, turn this way. Something tells me I shouldn't have turned that way. But I'm like, you're the native speaker, let's go, you know? I see these cops who it didn't come out too well, but there's these cops that are behind us. And then all of a sudden we hear this thing that doesn't sound like a siren in the US, but it is definitely a siren. And I'm going, Erica, she's like, just keep driving. I'm like, Erica, we're not supposed to be going this way. So we get out or we stop, right? Cause we're not gonna outrun the police. We're not even gonna try to outrun the police in Brazil. Um, Erica gets ready to talk to them and they're like, no, you're going down the wrong way, you can't do it, you got to come to the police station. And this was a good uh, experience in negotiation and it did not work. <laughs> so she was like, I don't know, we're not really from here, like we just didn't know, can you let us go? The guy's like, no. It gets so bad that she's like, well she only knows how to drive forward, she doesn't know how to put the car in reverse, right, as if that's going to work. I know how to put the car in reverse. Still didn't work. The police officer gets some guy who's walking down the street and he's like, hey, can you turn this car around for her so she can follow me down to the police station? And this guy does, and we end up following them to the police station. And they said that I didn't have a Brazilian license, which who, what visitor has a Brazilian license, right? So we are terrified. We're terrified. We think we're going to end up in jail in Brazil. And all I can think about is my mom is going to kill me if I ever make it home. So all that to say, um, we learned a lot about patience. We learned a lot about perspective. And we are definitely glad that we survived that story. I don't think we were in any real threat. If we had some money, they probably would have taken it, but, you know, it, it seemed like once they got started, they couldn't let us go, so. And then this last one is a picture in Cuba. It says, sin educación no hay revolución posible. So without education, there is no possible revolution, which I think is pretty cool, especially being here at an educational institution. All right. Um, so creativity. Um, I have my class here, so as far as my, my students, how many of you have ever been stuck in a rut when it comes to creativity? Have you had creator's block? Yes, all right. So I'd actually been suffering from creator's block for a number of years, like before I even moved here. I stopped my business, I was a designer, I had a line of clothing. Um, I could create for other people, but I couldn't create for myself. I just couldn't do it, and I realized, oh, the reason why I wasn't able to do it was because I haven't been traveling. I've had the privilege of traveling um, since I was a young child. Like I was able to go to the Netherlands, spend time at my father's place, spend time, my dad lived in London for some time, I spent time in London as well. And what I realized was that travel was really a huge part of my process, a part of my being. And when we went to Iceland, um, our first stop, um, what I found was really interesting, first and foremost, was like, A, America and its influence pretty much everywhere we went, right? Um, pop culture, products, um, even funny things. There's going to be a t-shirt that I'm going to show you that was in Croatia, and it was about streets in Brooklyn. And I'm thinking, who knows about these streets in Brooklyn? Like, nobody, like, what? I did. I actually lived on one of those streets when I lived in Brooklyn. Um, but I love the artwork. I really love, like, like every, the infrastructure of Iceland, um, I thought this Viking hotel was hilarious. Um, <laughs> and this was actually, this was at what, three o'clock in the morning? Wasn't it three o'clock? Yeah, three o'clock in the morning in May, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then also I really loved um, just the aesthetics, like how I felt like every, every place we went to as far as a restaurant, it was so well curated, well designed, even a little, like patate frites or like a French fry shop. Like they took a, a lot of time in basically designing the space, um, all of the collateral that's included in the space, um, signage. And when we went to London, um, my dad lived in Camden Town. So when I, and, and the last time I was in London was over 20 years ago. And when I went there again and I visited, I couldn't even really, I didn't recognize it at all but I still felt the same energy. Um, there's a huge market. 
So there are a lot of artisans, a lot of designers. I didn't really want to take pictures of them because I didn't want them to think that they were in a zoo and I didn't want to be that tourist, you know? But what I can tell you was that in this small section of London, there was a lot of talent. Um, and I found art and creativity everywhere I went, including all of the, um, the, train, the subway, uh, the tube stations. Um, so in Frankfurt, <laughs> So I, I included, like, so does anyone know, like, what do you think this is? Yeah, but, like, what kind of bug? Yes! I, I was in this chocolate shop minding my own business, and I'm like, what? Um, so the, um, the aesthetics and just, like, them going out of their way, thank, thank goodness these weren't, choc like, roach-filled chocolates. They, it was just covered with foil in the shape of a roach. So... I was really, A, baffled, intrigued, and I ended up buying about a pound of chocolate, but just not that. Um, <laughs> um, and this is a relief at the Basilica um, off of mine, right? Yes. And then this was like old Frankfurt um, that had, um, it, it just didn't get hit um, in the war. It, 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 the, the bombs fortunately did not uh, get to those buildings. Um, and then there's the um, Opera House as well. And then a new initiative in Frankfurt is that they're building new buildings in the aesthetic of old Frankfurt, which I thought was great. Um, and I had to really do a double take to see, okay, wait, what part was new? What part was old? Um, and I really, really enjoyed that tour and the architecture and, and just really getting to know Frankfurt and understanding it and, and why it is called like Manhattan. <laughs> um, I think I have more. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, then London. Yes. Ah, Athens. Um, so everywhere we went um, when we were in Athens, um, I felt like I was just literally coming across like a antiquities ancient architecture um, and then also weird little spaces like this was a coffee shop I just I just loved this coffee shop like a it was mobile B um, it was parked into another space it was I think it turns into a nightclub <laughs> so they really utilize um, and make the most of their spaces and I guess their leases. Um, and then we also saw a lot of like street art as well, um, which um, I thought was really intriguing. Um, it made me think about a lot of things, about my artistic process, what's missing with my artistic process. Oh, here it is. That's, here's the t-shirt I was talking about. So yeah, Flatbush, Brooklyn New York. I'm like, really? Um, and this was at a random store in Dubrovnik. Um, I'm also one of those mid-century modern like maniacs and I just love the Eames lounge chair and the ottoman. Who else knows about this chair? Ah, okay, yes, yes. So this was actually in the lounge at the airport. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was like, and, and let me tell you, it was like 40 of them, right? I was drooling. I was like, wow, like, I, and I thought, well, how can I, like, can I get away with taking one of, no, no, I cannot. Um, and they're not repros either. They're, they're legitimate Eames lounge chairs. Um, also, like we went to um, Old, Old City, Dubrovnik. So I don't know, I think, I think some of you know I'm a big fan of Game of Thrones. So I was like super excited and I ended up paying $20 for I think a $5 keychain just so that I could take a picture on this mock throne. Like that was the highlight for me of Dubrovnik. Um, um, <laughs> um, but also like going through old city and then uh, like looking and kind of trying to recognize areas where they've been filmed and then also, you know, where there's some green screening. So I, I walked the steps, who's, who's walked, who, the, the, the steps of shame, you know what I'm talking about, Game of Throners? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I walked those same stairs of shame. Um, forgot to take a picture of it though. I was so excited. <laughs> and what ended up happening, um, after this trip was I finally opened up and I finally started sketching again. And I started making, you know, I had actually 
anyone who's in fashion, you know you collect fabrics, right? I have an obscene amount of fabrics back east, but I actually took half, not half, no, not even, a tenth, no, not even, like a 20th of what I, what I own. And I took it out west with me, and I said, I'm going to make something of this, right? And I kind of have to because I have a show at the Kaneko coming up in October slash November. Um, so I took out my fabrics, and I'm working on my mood board, and I'm also working on sketching, and I'm looking at, okay, I'm working with fringe. How am I going to make this garment? I'm going to make some body wear as well. Uh, I have to order some other materials. I'm going through the de development process again, but I feel like I'm going through it with new eyes. Um, and it's because of my travels and how real, I was kind of amazed at how much it's impacted what I do as a person. <laughs> I also really want to point out too that it sounds, it probably sounds like we've got, you know, like trust funds, right, to travel the world. We, we don't. I can tell you that we don't. Um, and just to let you know, I started traveling when I was in college. So um, I picked a study abroad program. So all of you students who are in college, we have study abroad programs here. When you go to four-year schools, I highly, highly, highly encourage you to go study abroad. It's probably one of the easiest times to do it because you are not 100% independent, meaning you have a structure to go into. There's financial aid available, and then the benefit that you will receive just from being, even if you don't like the experience, it's still an experience that a lot of people don't get to have, and that sets you apart from other people around you. So. Um, there are just there are ways to make it happen. It doesn't have to be out of reach. There, you know, when you set a goal, it's not always attainable when you set it. If you just set attainable goals that you can get to right then, like how much fun is that, right? There's definitely some beauty in working towards the goal. So if you are thinking about traveling, put it as a goal and then work backwards to figure out how to get there. So. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, cross-cultural competency. As educators, we need to be cross-culturally competent, right? Not just like, okay, student to teacher culturally competent, but like differences between black folks, right? So um, here I'm in Haiti. I'm, I'm African-American. I can trace my roots back to, I don't know, a couple generations back, and then after that I don't know where my folks come from. Um, but here I've made friends in Haiti and ended up doing a workshop at a law school in Haiti. That was in 2013. But we look the same, but we have very different experiences, right? And there are some commonalities, but I have to figure out how to communicate with folks, not just the language barrier, right? But also just understanding culture. And I think as educators, we have a responsibility to do that. Um, I asked research for some numbers. On the new applications for schools, they're asking about countries of origin, but right now I just have languages. Right now there are 47 languages that are spoken at American River College. Uh, this is out about 32,000 students, right? Over, um, about 47 languages. The biggest, of course, is English. And then we have um, Spanish, Russian, um, Arabic, Farsi, got some Portuguese in there, but there's 47 different languages. When a student comes to school, and if you can even say hello in their native language, it goes a long way, right? So I've used to be more conversant in Haitian Creole, and now sadly to say I, I've lost it all. Um, this, this is uh, this is actually in Oakland, but two of my Brazilian friends, <laughs> and that's over there in Brazil. So I've learned to speak some Portuguese. Um, this is interesting because I've spent time in law school in Haiti and a little bit after, and then I spent, I studied abroad in undergrad in Cuba, and in 2016 when I went back to Cuba, I saw a group of like journalists walking down the street and I heard them speaking Haitian Creole. So if you know anything about the history of that area, there's a lot of influence from Haiti in Cuba. And I remember when I studied there in 2006, I had this Spanish professor of um, history of Latin America and the Caribbean. He asked me what was the difference between Haiti in Cuba, and why was one country so poor, Haiti, and what was going on with Cuba, right? I'm, I'm 20, 
two years old and I have no idea what he's talking about. Little did I know that the next year I would be involved in a human rights delegation in law school that would go to Haiti. He set the foundation for this inquiry that I could that I could, um, would pursue, and then 10 years later, I run into a group of journalists from Haiti walking around Cuba doing their own kind of investigation, and now I'm able to speak with the Haitian journalists and a little bit of Creole and speak with the Cubans, of course, in Spanish, and it was just like two of my favorite countries came together in one place, and I'm really excited, you can see right now, maybe you're not that excited about it, but I just thought it was so cool, you know? Um, here, you can't really see him that well, but this, this, is, this is in Croatia. He told us that he played a role in Game of Thrones. For four seasons, yeah. He, 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 I think he finally got let go uh, season seven. Yeah, so he's unemployed right now. But. <laughs> So we, we just met him, uh, a friend of mine is Croatian, she connected us with her cousin who was there, this is one of her cousin's friends, and like in the area, everybody, everybody knows each other, right? So you get in good with one, then you become like the family, and then the family introduces you to all of their friends and family, and so he was like, yeah, you know, do you watch Game of Thrones? And I'm like, no. Diane was like, yeah. He was like, do you know this character? And I'm like, no. Diane said, yeah. And he was like, that was me. I said, so? And she was like, yeah. <laughs> so it was, it was just cool. What'd you say? Which character? Do you remember which character? He was, um, I think he was one of the, in the Septon, like uh, one of the Scepter people, like speaking, yeah. Uh, no, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. So it was pretty cool. Um, and I had another experience in, in Cuba as well where um, food for tourists can be expensive. And so, you know, you make friends with local folks and you figure out how to be able to eat for a couple dollars and you're putting someone, money in directly into someone's hands. And so we're going to the lady's house to pick up the food and the, her ex-husband comes by. They have this grown kid and they're still friends, right? And so the father's like super excited. He's like, let me just go upstairs and, and just show you something. And he comes down with a Grammy, a Latin Grammy. We ended up ordering food from the mother of a band member of this Cuban group called Septero Santiago, and they have won Latin Grammys. And we're sitting in the living room, and I'm like, am I really understanding this correctly in Spanish, right? Am I really getting it? And I'm like, what are the chances of just by being in a place, being open to people, being able to converse, that what am I ever going to hold a Grammy ever again in my life? I don't think I, I didn't put the picture up there, but I'm like, there's a lot of Grammy, like, what? You know, it's just, just super crazy. So it definitely um, pays to be cross-culturally fluent. It opens up your world. It makes the people that you are reaching out to feel more included. I think as educators, we're able to draw from more examples. We're able to draw from more sources. And whatever message that we're trying to put out there, it doesn't work if it doesn't land, right? So if we have more things to draw from, then we are, be able, we are better communicators and then in turn also better educators. Okay, I'm also doing empathy. So traveling gives you empathy. Um, I, you know, grew up in the U.S. The U.S. has not been in occupied territory since the history, maybe, of the U.S., right? The inception of the U.S. Um, we've had some wars, but not really war on our property, or on our property, on our land, since the Civil War, right? So when I first went to Haiti, Haiti was... Um, occupied by the UN, by MINUSTA. And that was really an eye-opening experience to, to walk around and see UN troops just handling weapons and, you know, something pops off and I'm just around. Now, I know that other people have experiences like that, but growing up in the US, we're really privileged because we haven't had experiences like that. And just to open up my mind to be sensitive to what about some of our students who are coming from occupied territories, right? What is that like? So I have been multiple times to Haiti when it was um, occupied by Manusta, but I get to leave, right? I get to go home. Um, also, this woman, I took a number of photos of her in her process. I just thought she was probably the strongest person on earth. Um, I think she was helping to build a house. She has this bucket on her head, but she would come to the shore and she would get the wet sand, put it in the bucket, lift it up, put it on her head and walk back, right? 
And just like, just thinking about, I mean, I, I grow and I'm like, oh my God, it's Tuesday. I've got two classes today. You know, oh, it's raining. I don't want to go anywhere. I just wish I could sleep in. I, you know, and then I'm reminded of this picture. I'm like, okay, Asha, you, <laughs> you've got it pretty good, right? I don't have to lift buckets of sand over my head. Uh, and just thinking also about the process of building houses. Um, and then here, I just thought this was funny. So this was a little plane that I, that I took from uh, Port-au-Prince, this small town called Jeremy. Now, you can't, I can't stand up all the way in the plane, right? Um, the plane is an old Russian plane, and it says in Russian, um, you know, use your seatbelt, and then you go to put the seatbelts on, the seatbelts don't work. It ha you remember those, those cars with the triangle windows in front where you'd flip the tab and the window would pop out? This plane has those triangle windows, okay? It's not a seven Boeing 747. This thing is like, the pilots are so cool, they pop open the window and they lean their elbows outside of the window. And, you know, he's just so cool. His hands are over his head. And then they tell you, sit on this side, not on this side. There's only about 15 seats on the plane. Um, and you just have... You know, our, even if we have to take the bus to get places, right? We have transportation systems. We can, we have um, comfortable ways to do things, even if we are inconvenienced for a moment. But to be in a place where you got to take a plane, where if you lean to the right, the plane's going to the right, right? Um, or in an occupied territory, or not being able to buy, you know, brand new clothes, just clothes that are new for you, right? It's not, it's not bad, it's not better or worse, it's just different, and there's beauty in that difference that we can all draw from. All right, so um, whenever I travel, it, helps expand my resources. Like I have more that I can reference, which helps me in the classroom. Um, with this trip, I counted uh, how many friend requests I'd received on Facebook, and it was over 50. <laughs> so we've met pretty much, I feel like, except for maybe Germany. Did we meet anyone in Germany? Yeah, I guess we, I guess we were, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but, well, I mean, we did. I mean, the, the, the woman from the, uh, uh, what is it, African Queen restaurant? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, with that, I feel like human capital is a resource, right? So meeting different people from different cult, uh, countries and cultures. Um, let me see. Bulgaria, Serbia, Montenegro, um, what was that gentleman, where was Augie from again? I forgot. Kenya? Oh, Kenya? Okay. Kenya, um, London, Spain. Um, I, there are so many people that we met. And, and this was just at the Cuban Salsa Festival. Um, and uh, yeah, so th this one, this is a funny story. <laughs> so the world is really small, like really, really, really tiny. Um, I met Ava on the street with our new friend, Josue, and they both live in Madrid. Um, Ava is a professor of astronomy, and she used to teach astronomy at Johns Hopkins. I used to teach at a community college in Baltimore, and she, I don't know how Baltimore w was even mentioned, but somehow we ended up speaking about it. Then we ended up literally like trying to figure out who are our common common areas or common places we would hang out. And there were quite a few, and I'm like, how do we not ever cross paths? Then we started naming common people we may have in common. And I think we named two people that we have in common, but one is, uh, for the both of us, a really close friend. So Abraham, he actually lives in San Francisco, and he's actually one of the reasons why I'm actually here. Um, and yeah, he's our mutual friend. And um, he works in tech, he's a, um, I think he's like a technical writer um, for Cisco. And how would you ever think that that would happen in, on the street in Athens, Greece? Like that, I felt like that was a bit insane to me, but in a really great way. <laughs> um, and then we have here um, Alex. Alex is now, he, he had his um, salsa class, right? Because I saw all this, all this stuff on, yeah, 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 he had a success, uh, and NBC, I think, interviewed him. 
Yeah, and I think it's like NBC US interviewed him, so I have to find the interview. Um, but yeah, so these are some of the people that we've met and some of our new Facebook friends. And of course, we're keeping our doors open. Uh, I'm pretty sure it'll end up being like Hotel Asha, Hotel Diane, uh, sooner rather than later. Um, but I, I just love meeting people, learning new perspectives, learning new ways to do things. Um, I learned a couple of new dances um, uh, at the Cuban Salsa Festival, like I've learned son, and then I learned rumba, um, and I need to practice. Uh, I think I can dance now after my hiatus with my surgery. Um, but um, what really, really moved me um, was the fact that I was able to see antiquities in person. And I, I'm, I'm gonna speak about it a little bit more um, as far as like what I think is a concept, and it's in a book, it doesn't really relate to me, I can't, I don't know what that means versus seeing it in person, but I draw from a lot of resources and inspiration, especially um, going to and attending the um, National Archaeological Museum in Athens, um, like looking at the Koros, uh, which is like I finally see this guy that I've been reading about since college in person, um, Athena, and then also the jockey of Artemision. Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll discuss it a little later, like how like much of an impact it was on me. Um, and then seeing the Acropolis in, in its glory. I just felt so small and like a little ant. And this has, la you know, these buildings have been here for thousands of years. They're being restored. So, you know, I took photos of um, the Propylia, the Pro Propyla, the um, Theater of Dionysus, um, the Old Temple of Athena, and then many different um, viewpoints of the Parthenon. All right. And then also looking at like Old City Dubrovnik the architecture, so it was built in the 13th and 14th centuries. Um, yes, besides the fact that I did see the specials from, what's his name, Rick? Rick Steves, yeah, I wanna call him Rick Dees. I don't know, I know, right? Um, I'm like, no, that's not his name. Um, but seeing it in a television show, literally, I was, before Asha mentioned it, I saw a special summer of 2017 about Croatia and Dubrovnik. And I thought, I need to go there. I don't know how I'm gonna do it. And then Asha mentions, because I know you're probably gonna have questions like, how did you go to, how, why did you decide on all these cities and all these places, why? Really it was our travel path and our travel plan. So we, would, we took WOW Airlines, which flew into Iceland. We'd have to have a layover anyway, so we stayed in Reykjavik. Then we, uh, we traveled on to Frankfurt because we'd have to have a layover in Frankfurt anyways. So we decided to extend the layover for a few days. Then to Calagria, Greece. Then we took a bus to Athens. Um, then we, we said, well, we're so close to Croatia. We might as well go to Croatia. And that's how we landed in, in Malini and Dubrovnik. And then um, we had to leave from London Gatwick. So hey, let's spend some time in London. All right, so um, this is the one and only time I've ever worn this like bath hat. <laughs> it was given to me for Christmas from a friend. It's like a shower cap. I'm like, what am I ever gonna wear this? I said, you know what? I'm gonna wear it in the lagoon in Iceland, right? Because have you guys heard of the Blue Lagoon? Okay, well, the Blue Lagoon has a long wait list. So we didn't go to the Blue Lagoon. We went to the Secret Lagoon. <laughs> um, but for me, you know, I'm one of those people who, as soon as I'm, like, semi-conscious in the morning, my brain kicks on, and it just, like, keeps going and going and going. And it's really, really hard for me to relax if I'm here. So I think that's part of the reason why I love traveling so much, because you just can't be connected all the time. There's new things to distract you from being connected. So for me, travel is really, really a time where I can rest and become rejuvenated. Um, so we're just, you know, trying out new things. Diane on the slack line, living our best lives in the pool, in the um, hot springs with the, the noodles. 
um, you know, the ocean that's actually in Brazil. Um, good food for me is also relaxing. I love really good food. So here's some, some good food from Haiti. And I just thought this was so funny. This restaurant is called Anti-Stress Restaurant, which I thought just fit perfectly with rest and rejuvenation. So it is a time to um, be in tune with yourself in a different way than you get to be when you're here, when you have all these responsibilities and you have things to do and you have places to go that, um, it's just, it's just different, and, and different can be really good sometimes, you know? I already did that. I think we're at the end. What's next? What's next? Just click on it with your mouse. So um, I think that those are all the, the pictures and stuff that we have. We're talking about what's next, though. So we do have some, some plans. So Diane will be headed to Bulgaria this summer, um, and I am trying to still do it big. So in March, I'm going to Mexico City, and then this summer, I'm going to Kenya and Tanzania, and we'll follow it up with Portugal. Um, and actually, Professor Kamau back there will also be in Kenya at the same time, so we're working together. So there's resources in your midst to make these things, these things happen, for sure. So um, that's a little bit about our story, and I'm, I'm delighted that we were able to travel together because we were able to talk about things from an educator's perspective, but also just from a life perspective. And then, you know, how beautiful is it that we've been able to do something that we love and we get to share it with you at our place of work, right? So I'm always thinking about, do I need to quit and become a full-time traveler and like one of those blog people? And I'm like, okay, no, I don't. Maybe yes. <laughs> well, I don't have to because now I can talk about my travels here at school. So that's awesome. So um, thank you guys for listening. And we will certainly entertain any questions that you guys have. Mm -hmm. Good question. So the question is, um, where did we stay when we were hopping around from place to place? So uh, we stayed in hotels the whole time? Hotels and Airbnbs. Um, in Cuba and in Brazil, I usually try and stay, um, I rent a place from a family. So depending on where I am, I'll do a couple of different things. I really like to be able to get to know local folks and local culture. So in Dubrovnik, we stayed at a bed and breakfast, but it was the bed and breakfast owned by a family friend of my good friend here. So the family is around, they run the bed and breakfast, you know, the cousin comes by, and so we're not staying in the cousin's house, but we feel like we're a part of the community. You know, where people just kind of walk by and like, hey, are you guys there? Come on down, you know? Um, so I would say we definitely had, or for me personally, I really like those experiences where I'm able to just kind of see how, how people live, you know, and what it's like in those areas. Any other questions? Yes? So, like, how did you decide what inspired you to Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm trying to, it, it does seem like it's a struggle. Mm -hmm. What is exactly, what's it like for you to have those that you have taken into a process? Oh. Um, creating collections, students have to pull inspiration from different resources. So um, in my um, lecture classes, we're actually gonna work on mood boards for creating collections and illustrations on Monday, and I'm going to be pulling from those photos and from all that information, just so that it's an example, like this is what you can do. You don't have to travel halfway across the world to do it, um, but you can definitely create um, your own images rather than looking for images on the internet, uh, even in your backyard. Um, and then incorporating them, uh, creating a collection, a title, a theme around it, and then um, support materials around that. So that's one way that I use my travels. Yeah, so, and the question is just for the folks watching on video is, is how do I use my travel experiences to affect my students who are in legal assisting or studying the law, right? Well, um, Part of it is just tapping into different legal systems around the world and asking people, well, what is it like? If you commit a crime here, what is the sentence? Or how does it work? How does voting work here? You know, wh who really, 
has the power to make a change in society? Does it have to come from the legislature, so people writing laws, or can it come from the people deciding to vote? Um, in, in school, I had a couple different internships with the United Nations, and so my, I tell my students about that as well. You know, you, there is law all over the world, and the beautiful thing about law is that it affects everything, right? From like the regulation of the density of your paper to what kind of accommodations we have to make here at school. And so law touches everything that we do, and I'm able to bring that into the classroom. Uh, last semester, I think we had 17 languages spoken in my class, right? We had like 12 or 13 countries that people came from. We had um, probably, f this is about a class of 45, I think we had 20 something who were working on their AAs, 15 or so who were, um, had a master's degree or an undergraduate degree and then a few more who had a master's degree. So, um, my classes are really, really diverse, right? And we're studying California law, but I am a much better educator because I can talk to my student who came from Afghanistan a little bit about what's going on in his society where he came from, and I can draw parallels. Tell me about your legal system, and I can tell you a little bit about ours. So I think it just, it just gives me more depth to pull from and more breadth to talk about. Mm -hmm. Don't be shy. Anybody else? Yeah. Is it better to do a study abroad program through an a through ARC or four year? Why not do both? That's my favorite answer. Um, do it all, right? Just see how it works. You have different experiences. So I I studied abroad in undergrad. I studied abroad. Uh, in the summer in law school, and my last semester in law school, I did it in the Netherlands. So I was able to study abroad in school three times. So as much as you want to do it, as much as you're able to do it, you can make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, you don't, again, this traveling is expensive, right? Um, but there are associations here in town um, that you can, you can become a member of, like Internations. Um, they meet once a month, and it's a really friendly group. They're from all over the world. They're expats. They're also Americans. Um, so you can make connections that way as well. And I'm part of that group, and I've made some really great friends recently. And another beautiful thing, too, is that um, people are so much more friendly when you travel. You know how here we'd be like, how you doing? And we don't really stop to listen to the answer. Or we say, oh, yeah, like, you know, come over anytime when we don't really mean it. I have found that when people say, you know, come and visit me when I'm traveling, they really mean it, right? So I met a guy who was born in Benin, West Africa, raised in France, and I met him in Cuba. He came, that was in July August. He came to visit me in the Bay Area in November, and a year later, um, he had moved to Barcelona, and I was able to see him in Barcelona. And he was like, you know what, before he'd moved from Ireland, he was working in Ireland when I met him. All these countries, right? Who, who could dream of all this stuff? But he was like, come to Ireland, you got a place to stay. People say that all the time. Our friends in Madrid, come out and stay with us. So the most expensive thing can be the tickets, either tickets or housing, right? And how we ended up tacking on all these cities to our little tour is that WOW Airlines had a ticket one way for like 300 bucks. So we're like, well, 300 bucks? Okay, that's worth it to get, we gotta go to Europe anyway, right? So we might as well stop there. And then the tickets in between the European countries are a lot cheaper than they are here. So it, it definitely makes a difference. But there are ways to do it where you don't have to spend an arm and a leg. Um, there are hostels. They have youth hostels, but they also have not-so-youth-ish hostels, right, <laughs> that are more accommodating. It's a great way to, like, have activities brought to you so you don't have to go out and figure everything out on your own. But I, I bet, you know, like, even my, my friend right now is in Jackson, Mississippi, which is where my, my family is from, and I said, call my cousin. She's there. She's at the museum. She'll, like, host you for the day. Call my other cousin. You know, you can go and talk to her. You know, we just connect people. And there's something about traveling, I think, that makes people more open and more willing to to do it that you don't necessarily see in your daily life here. Like here, we're just, I gotta get to work, I gotta get home, I gotta get the kids, I gotta get dinner on the table, I gotta get to bed because I'm sleepy and I'm cranky, and I gotta get up and do it all over again the next day, right? It's just different. Can you explain that since you've been traveling
Um, yeah, I'm actually not from here. So I, um, I'm an immigrant. So I came here at three and a half years old to the DC area um, to get away from political stuff. Um, but yeah, I feel like it helps. It helps me, uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I used to definitely be more of an introvert, especially when I was younger. And then having to travel alone to the Netherlands or, you know, I, I have to get in through Heathrow and then connect to, the, to get to Skip Hole, and I'm by myself. I have no one else to really rely on but myself, so, and I'm 18, um, so that made me definitely come out of my shell def more, much more. And I'm more comfortable, too, because I'm, work I, I'm, I'm a, among, sorry, I'm amongst people from many different cultures, so I'm just really comfortable like meeting other people. I, I feel like sameness is boring. Um, and I always want to learn. And I am always learning from everyone that I meet. So, yeah. What about you? I would say I've always been pretty bold. Um, <laughs> Surprise, right? You couldn't tell. Um, I, I, I have actually become more introverted as I've gotten older um, in teaching because I think it just draws so much energy and I love it, but now I need more time to just be quiet and kind of reset. Um, but traveling, when you have to figure something, it's like you don't know how strong you have to be until you have to be strong sometimes. And it's not always because there's a crisis, but it's just like, I mean, in Athens, right, the, the Greek alphabet, like we probably know alpha, beta, zeta, delta, you know, if you take math, right? But we don't know that many. I'm like, how in the world are we supposed to figure out what the street sign says, right? And at some point, another story, we were in a cab in Athens, and there was a guy from Japan who had come to the Salsa Festival, and he looked lost, and, and we had got this cab, so we pulled over to put him in our car, and he was trying to figure out the hotel. We ended up, so, he, so Google Translate on your phone is a beautiful, beautiful resource, right? He's translating from Japanese to English, and I'm translating on my phone from English to Greek, so we can tell the cab guy, the cab driver, where to go, right? Um, I don't know if that answers your question about being introverted or not, but it, there is something about having to communicate that makes you more bold and definitely more forthright. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, have we connected with people to the extent that we will collaborate on projects? Have you done that, Diane? Yeah, I, I believe I did. I collaborated on some stuff when I was in grad school. Um, I just don't, I just don't remember specifically. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I have sort of and not really, right? So in, in Haiti, I have gone back a couple times to do workshops for lawyers, there's law students that are there. Um, but I have a really big aversion to coming in as an outsider and telling people what they should do right like that call that that colonizer aspect and and it's easy to do as an american tourist and i don't want to do that so if people ask me for help or to collaborate then i will do it but i've also been approached like in cuba i've been approached by um a, a woman from new york who started a yoga studio in singapore who wants to do a yoga ret retreat in cuba and i'm like eh, it sounds cool but i want you to collaborate with cubans because they're there and then put money in their hands and like, you know, why are you gonna bring your outside force to make money off of the folks in this country, right? But um, by the same token, I have another Cuban friend who's doing a music and dance workshop and he wants me to help him put it together. So it's coming from him and I'm collaborating, but I will not impose my ideas or, or start a project someplace else unless somebody asks me to do it. No other questions? Yeah. What are, the done what are the craziest things we've done in whatever country? You mean aside from being arrested by the Brazilian police? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm not fast enough to break out of Brazilian jail. What are the craziest things we've done? Yeah, where are the salsa pictures? Um, the craziest, like crazy, I need some context. Remember, I'm employed by this institution. <laughs> like, 
Okay, something that got me out of my shell. So I um, was in Jamaica for New Year's with my dad and my sister, and I'm terrified of heights. And Diane can attest this because in the, the old wall in Dubrovnik, like it's a really high wall, and that fence is like this big. And I'm really tall anyway, so I figured like that line was not at my center of gravity. It was like just enough that if I stumbled, it would just take my feet out and I would go down the hill. So I'm like walking, I'm like, you know, crawling up the, the thing, right? So all that to say that I'm really terrified of heights. But ever since I was probably 12, I have always wanted to parasail. Always, parasailing is where you have this long cord, it's attached to a parachute, and you have this person who looks tiny up there, and they're, you know, flying around the sky, and the cord is attached to the boat, and the boat pulls you around, and it just looks so beautiful and so peaceful. But I've always been so terrified to do it because I'm afraid of heights. And in the U.S., it's really expensive to do. So in Jamaica, it's a lot cheaper to do. And I figured this last time, I'm like, okay, Asha, you were 35 years old. You are not going to be afraid for the rest of your life. You are going to get in this boat. You're going to pay your little $85 to go parasail, and you're going to enjoy it. And I'm up there like, oh, God, please let me come back down. And I'm rationalizing. Well, if the parachute, if the cord breaks off, at least I'm over water and it's a parachute. You know, all these, like, crazy self-talk things. So, um I can't say it was super crazy, but it was one of the things that at least I was able to push myself to do, and I was really proud of myself for doing it, because the next time that I'm afraid, at least I have this experience to draw on, right? You have that logic, and you have that fear, and, and courage is not moving in the absence of fear, it's moving in the face of fear, right? So even though that's just my little, my little parasailing adventure, that was one thing that I'm, I'm, I'm proud of myself for doing, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so if you happen to go to um, Europe, it's really easy to go to other countries within Europe, and it's really cheap. I mean, they're, you know, they have inter-country tickets for like 49 euros, um, 59, 69 euros, um, and, and there's a train system that works really, really well. So uh, when I studied abroad in law school in the Netherlands, uh, a friend of mine was gone every weekend. She's like, I'm just gonna put it on the credit card. Not that I necessarily advise that, but that was her choice, right? She's like, I'm doing everything because then I, she knew she'd be able to pay it off later. Um, and so, yeah, take advantage. I mean, one of the, I didn't realize I liked cheese until I got to the Netherlands, right? Because they would have these like nut and cheese like mobile trailer things that would come and set up like a farmer's market, you know, every couple days out of the week and I was the person who liked cheddar cheese in a grilled cheese sandwich but not on a burger and maybe mozzarella if it was string cheese but like nothing else and then somehow I happened to um, be challenged had to be challenged to try some cheese and I discovered that I liked it there but but the countries are so close together you can try all the go to all these different places and in Europe what's cool is that almost every country speaks a different language you know so definitely travel Definitely get out. Weekend. Weekend adventures. I'm just going to learn how to kiteboard in Greece this summer. That's it. Yeah. Pardon? Uh, let me, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> 